My name is Charles Hadcock and I am a sculptor and have been working in my studio since 1989. I studied fine art sculpture at Cheltenham Art School in the early 80s and then followed on to the Royal College of Art in London, graduating in 1989. Since graduating in 1989, I have held numerous exhibitions uh, around the country and have been in several group exhibitions around the world. Uh, my work it appears in locations uh, all over the country primarily uh, in the public arena uh, and my most well-known sculpture I believe is on Brighton Beach although uh, the sculpture torsion outside of Canary Wharf tube station is also very well known. Uh, I think that's quite important to exhibit sculpture amongst the workplace or amongst people uh, so they can enjoy it. Because I am a process-driven sculptor, i.e. I like to make things personally, each sculpture of mine takes many different uh, processes or procedures to get to the finished object. So with all my sculpture and objects, it starts with a drawing. Very simple drawing. I use very simple techniques. I use rulers and compass and French curves and and I've been working on a body of work which he's using. You can see that I'm just using very simple uh, triangles to actually dictate, very simple geometry. There's no measurements here. It's just what I can do, stretch it out, bring it forward. And from a very simple drawing like this, I might expand it, but then uh, I like to draw with three dimensions. So taking something as simple as this and then creating the shapes on something like this in, in styrofoam. So these can, the drawings can be translated from that to a very simple drawing on the computer which will then cut these shapes out for me in styrofoam. And that allows me to play with them, play with the styrofoam and come back. So once I've done the styrofoam, I then, to link it more to my work, laminating a rock texture. So this is a, this is a direct cast of a rock in a laminate. So I've made a laminate of a rock texture, which I can, you know, put in, use um, filler to get rid of any undercuts, because when that gets moulded in plaster, it can't have an undercut. You need to be able to pull it out. So very simply, working on that, this is ready. This, this piece is actually ready now to be moulded. Take that out. and then it's hollow, guaranteed uniform thickness throughout, which then can actually, that can be cast into the terracotta. So all these big pieces, they're all hollow. They're all hollow internally, and that's quite important, otherwise we'd never lift them. I mean, even that piece there is about 400 kilos. So bizarrely, it's not actually that dissimilar to the weight of iron. Although it's very good to see the works in the white, in the flesh, against the white, I can see, see the shape and the form that they're creating and whether actually it's stimulating to me, whether I'm going to make that in terracotta or on the bigger scale, I think I'm going to make it in iron. So if I'm going to make a sculpture that is, needs to be five, six meters high, or bigger, the, the scale and the mass is very important to me, so I might choose cast iron. Cast iron is an incredibly strong material for building. Its strength is in compression, so I can build on it. If I'm making a smaller object, I might use bronze, because the finish of bronze is, for example, if it needs to be exterior, it's very good, but I can do more delicacy 
with bronze than I can't, can with cast iron. Okay, so we're now in the bronze studio or the non-ferrous studio. So the idea is that in this workshop, I can work on bronze and I can work on aluminium and nickel bronze and try and avoid contamination that cast iron and steel will uh, do to the bronze. So in this workshop, we just try and make, you know, this is assembly and finishing. All heavy grinding work goes elsewhere. This is a, a one to five, so scale model of the object that I'm uh, making in iron. Uh, this obviously weighs a few kilos. The iron piece will weigh 10 tonnes. So this is hexad four. So there are six elements, so fins are six. So there's uh, three right hand and there's three left hand. So the whole point with working model like this is that I can iron out any real problems before I go to the big scale. This is a bolted piece and because it's pretty accurate then, because I tapped this into the right place, got it absolutely accurately, I could then drill it and then tap it so when I want to take them apart, I can do very, very easily. And there we go, you see? So that's beautifully tapped and threaded. And you can start seeing yeah, how, it, how it sort of starts working together. And I'll do that with all the sections so that when you see it as a complete piece, it will be six individual castings all bolted together. And that's very much part of the aesthetic that I'm interested in with all of my sculpture, is that they are multiple elements or multiples that bolt together to create a whole. I like to keep everything under my control. So anything I can do here, I do here. Anything I can't do, I use my local supply chain and then once they've done their bit, everything is touched by me. So I think it's very important that the hand of the artist is visible in the work. One of the things I struggle to do here on site is actually cast the metal. I've always enjoyed working with the same people because we've developed a dialogue together over many years. I've been working with the same foundry since 1987. Okay, here we are at uh, Shakespeare Foundry in High Walton, just outside Preston. It takes me about two minutes, three minutes from my studio to get here. Uh, it's one of the reasons I moved and left London was so I could be closer to this foundry, so I can come down at a drop of a hat when I'm working on something and actually be, be here. So I introduce Andrew, Andrew Howe, uh, one of the owners of Shakespeare, and uh, we work together on a lot of projects. Yeah, so Shakespeare Foundry, this site is one of three sites we've got, as Charles knows. We've another foundry in Bolton that specialises in stainless steel. We have a foundry in Egypt that casts stainless steel as well. On this site we cast grey iron and ductile iron primarily. Our maximum poured weight is about 35 metric tonnes, which is unique in the UK these days. We employ around 60 people, normally making boring engineering work, but when we get involved with people with imagination like Charles, it becomes interesting all of a sudden. I've started using um, other smaller foundries and I am working with a foundry very local to here. That's very exciting to me. There are young brothers and they're working very well on it. Okay, now we're here in the uh, small foundry, family-run foundry in uh, Blackburn. So what we've been showing is the uh, pattern being uh, sand molded with green sand and petrobon sand and the petrobon sand is the finer sand and then the green sand goes over it and then carbon dioxide is put through the sand to make it solid. The, the moulds are surrounded by a, a framework and box and then put on the benches and as you can see in the background 
the furnace is busy uh, heating, melting the metal. It's been heating for about nearly an hour now and it'll be another 25, 30 minutes before it goes. This process hasn't changed for thousands of years, so pouring molten metal into a, a sand mold is very good. But the scale for it is completely different from what we saw at the cast iron foundry. So when they were pouring six tons, we'll be pouring six, about 60 kilos, so a tenth of the size here. So they do all the pouring, and then the objects from here will come back to my studio ready for me to finish. So we knock the mould out of the sand and here it is without any of the sand on and what's really nice you can see all the runners and risers in the system and including the filter so there's your filter that stops when they pour the metal in you'll see you would have seen some of the metal takes the sand with it and that filter just grabs the sand to stop it going into the casting. So that's had all the sand knocked off and then we just cut the runners and risers off ready to come back to my studio like that. The finished work is then either exhibited or might have been sold prior to manufacture and then gets transported. For many years, I had a, a very big studio in, in South London, in Bermondsey. But I suddenly realised that it was more important to have a big space out of London, but to be closer to my supply chain, to my suppliers. And so in uh, 1999, I left London and I moved to Lancashire, and my studio complex now is just outside of Preston, Lancashire and it's in a rural environment. It's an old 18th century mill. It's for where I can invite curators, critics, galleryists, and potential clients to come and see the work in a very pure environment. But they can also come and see the work whilst it's being constructed, whilst I'm making it. We're here at Roachbridge Mill. Roachbridge Mill was a cotton mill from 1770 to 1875 and then from 1875 it became a paper mill and the reason why this mill is here on the river Darwin and you can see the bridge is because of the, the Darwin being a power source. Businesses that are located on the site are all using the electricity generated by the river just here. Um, I have redesigned and repositioned the new hydroelectric generator to be in exactly the same place that it was put in 1870. So what's fantastic about this whole site, and it's, a, it's quite a big site, is that it is self-sufficient. It's a proper sustainable environment. On the site, we still have the paper business, Roachbridge Paper Mill. We supply uh, luxury tissue paper to a lot of the high street shops, as well as a myriad of uh, engineers and other services that can help me with uh, what I do, but they have their own businesses. There's a, an exhibition build company. He builds exhibitions for people all over the world. Uh, he's on site. I have a steel fabricator, weld steel for all over the world, but it just does little jobs for me at times. And then there's pa a pattern maker, uh, and he makes patterns for the automotive industry, but can also make patterns for me. So it's sort of like a whole environment dedicated just to what I want to do. Never fails to amaze me when I'm looking at a fossil or, or, or a piece of stone, how the intricacy of a very small scale piece can look fantastic. So I always start with a very simple sketch, you know, when I'm thinking about how I'm going to split something down, whether it's going to be finned, whether it's not, with the cavity, I really, it's really important that you can see light through my sculptures in, in different places. So this is nine pieces and it's got this lovely 
very, very nice uh, shape here that it all splays off from. You can see here this beautiful way it thins out. And I think, I, I mean, I took that from a disc. That almost is shell-like there. And it's very nice. So from a very simple drawing like that, you get a very pure shape like that. I like my work to have longevity. I choose materials that have got natural longevity to them. So terracotta, cast iron, cast bronze, cast aluminium. I really enjoy that link between the engineered process and art. If you apply a uh, treatment to cast iron, you can seal it so that it, it, doesn't go, it doesn't deteriorate anymore. I use natural processes, so I use things like pure beeswax. I heat up the cast iron so that it, it, it removes all the moisture from the porosity or from the pores of the metal and replace that moisture with wax. It's a very interesting process to sort of superheat the metal, the moisture comes out and then replaces it with wax. And that treatment lasts a long time, develops a very nice patination, and you can just keep layering it over and over and over again. Again, so the sculpture on Brighton Beach is right next to the sea. So the iron is developing a natural patination with the rock textures and with the salt from the seawater. But because it's cast iron, it has a protective layer formed onto it by the rust. So I use rust as not only a visual, but also um, protection. With bronze, I use chemicals to enhance the color. Uh, might change it to a brown or to a black. Very traditional colors, so very traditional finishes and then again using traditional wax. I've been experimenting with uh, glazed terracotta. I like the fact that as a material, it has a history going back thousands of years. It also has the same uh, alchemy to it, i.e. it has been through fire, it's been changed just as the cast iron and the bronze and the aluminium I use have been changed using fire, so has the, the terracotta. So that's a process that it's transforming from a base material to something else. We have been experimenting quite a lot with terracotta and I had the opportunity to make a big installation for a collector in Ireland. I proposed a series of 36 columns in terracotta, and the tallest one being uh, uh, 150 um, centimetres, so 1.5 metres. That's pushing the boundaries of what they can actually put into the kiln in the terracotta right to the limits. And so I had 36 columns, all start with the same shape that way, and then by extruding them out, I'm creating a landscape of uh, environment. And geometrically, it's sort of very interesting when you have the same shape, the way it links put together, it's a proper tile tessellation. And it's a bit of a nod to uh, the Giant's Causeway in, in, in Ireland. Because it's gone through the process of fire, reacting on the glazing, I'm never quite sure how it's going to come out. So you get these lovely, almost accidents coming where it's feeding down. And this is a really beautiful glaze. The sculpture on Brighton Beach was a international competition that I won. I think there were over 80 applicants to, to get it, and I won it with my design and my presentation. And 
As a result of that, I have been commissioned for uh, public sculpture around the world from uh, my portfolio and from the development of exhibitions that I've had. The transporting of sculpture around the world is undertaken by a specialist company, the uh, MTech uh, Art Freight Handlers. I've been working with MTech since 1991, I think. They've installed most of my sculpture uh, in the public arena and for private clients. Um, it's a very, you know, we're talking about installing 10, 20 ton objects and they, I really need their help. Uh, they're busy installing some work of mine um, out in, uh, in America, in California at the moment. And from California, it had to be shipped to the location. And the, the location is private at the moment. But they even had to ship the sand and the cement to the location for the foundations. So the logistics of moving sculpture around the world is complicated, but not impossible, and best done by the professionals. For those people just starting out in their fine art career, uh, the advice I'd give them is never give up. It's incredibly complicated and the making sculpture, making objects, making anything is always very hard to do to anybody who is uh, just starting out is, you know, buy time in the studio. Make sure you dedicate enough time to your studio practice. We all have to have uh, a, a secondary source of income whilst we're establishing ourselves. That's perfectly normal. Keep going. Work, I've worked in bars, I've worked in all sorts of things. Early on in my career, I made sure that I would buy time in my studio. There's no shame in, in being commercially minded enough to buy, as I said, buy time in the studio. We all need that private space. <laughs>